Good evening and welcome to the Legal Roundtable. I'm Shaniqua Gray. Tonight on the Legal Roundtable, we'll be discussing self-defense in Louisiana in light of the Trayvon Martin shooting tragedy. You may be surprised to learn that Louisiana also has a stand your ground statute. Tonight we'll be talking about exactly what that statute provides, how it's different than Florida statute, and propose changes to make that legislation better. And then later on the Legal Roundtable, we'll be talking about Louisiana's compensation statutes, Louisiana's efforts to compensate the wrongly convicted who have been exonerated of those crimes. But first, self-defense in Louisiana. Our guest tonight are Representative Roy Burrell. He has served in the Louisiana House of Representatives for District 2 since 2003 and serves on the Administration of Criminal Justice, Ways and Means, and Municipal Parochial and Cultural Affairs Committees. He also formerly served in the Shreveport City Council and retired from Bell South Telecommunications in Bossier City after 22 years of service. Welcome, Representative Burrell. And also we have Professor Michelle Getty. She's an attorney who has taught law for over 20 years Years, including criminal law, constitutional criminal procedure, ethics and evidence. She has worked closely with the Louisiana legislature testifying on behalf of or against various pieces of legislation and has helped to draft parts of the Louisiana Code of Evidence and numerous criminal laws. Welcome both of you to the Legal Roundtable. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Getty, let's begin with you. We know that this Stand Your Ground statute has been in the media quite a bit since the Trayvon Martin shooting, and everyone is wondering exactly what does that mean. Could you explain what is a Stand Your Ground statute or Stand Your Ground law? And basically, it's not completely different from what we've had for a long time. I mean, if you can go back, way back, hundreds of years in history, and there was always this concept that if a person is attacked, they shouldn't have to run, they ought to be able to, quote, stand their ground and meet force with force, which is actually the exact words in Louisiana statute and in the Florida statute. That language, though, was not in our prior statute and, uh, before 2006 when that, the, the language was added in in 2006. Um, basically, in a self-defense situation, you can not have to run and you can stand your ground. And that's basically what it's about. Okay, but there is a need or a necessity that there be a real threat to your life in order for that provision to take place. Absolutely. You still have to be able to pr prove, except the burden of proof is on the state, but you still have to be able to say that you are defending yourself. And it has to be a reasonable use of force, and you have to reasonably believe that you're at risk of losing your life or receiving great bodily injury. The only thing the Stand Your Ground Law really does is tell a jury trying a case, or in the Florida situation apparently, the police or the prosecutor, um, that the reasonableness of your reaction cannot be judged by the fact that you didn't run. Mm -hmm. So in other words, prior to the enactment of the statute, uh, other than in your home, you might have been expected to run instead of fight back as far as it being a reasonable reaction to the threat against you. When this language was added, it was added so that, and basically it says in the statute, you can't, the jury is to be instructed that they can't consider the fact that you didn't run away as part of the reasonableness of your reaction. Okay. Now, could you explain the difference between Louisiana Stand Your Ground statute and the Florida Stand Your Ground statute, which is at the center of all of this Trayvon Martin controversy? Well, a couple of things. The main difference is in the Florida statute, there is a provision that basically tells the police officers that they have to make a judgment on the scene as to whether there's probable cause to believe that the person was engaged in self-defense. If they look at it and they have to decide the person was not reasonable in their reaction before they can even arrest him, that's being referred to in the media as immunity, mm -hmm. as the immunity part of that statute, although I'm not sure immunity is the correct word for it, but that's the way it's being referred to. When this, when this bill was brought before the legislature in 2006, there was a provision in the original bill that was very similar to that Florida provision. But before it was ever even heard, before Representative Burrell's committee, that was removed. It was amended out. And part of it was placed in another part, in, in another part of all of our statutory scheme, Title IX. Um, and that civil immunity, so if you're sued, you can raise this self-defense issue, was put someplace else. 
Um, but certainly the instruction to the police, you know, not to make an arrest is not any part of the Louisiana statute. So um, contrary to Florida where you have this effective immunity in Louisiana, the self-defense claim is more of an affirmative defense. Correct. Okay, Correct. and could you explain what that is for our listening audience? Well, in a homicide situation, and the irony is it differs in Louisiana between self-defense and a non-homicide situation where maybe you're being beaten up and you beat up back but you don't kill the person, and a homicide and a, and a self-defense in a homicide situation. In a homicide situation, uh, the the burden of proof is actually on the prosecutor. If, they, if it, the case goes before a jury, the prosecutor in a homicide case is required to prove that it was not self-defense. Mm -hmm. In a non-homicide case, the defendant is required to prove that it was self-defense. So when you're talking about an affirmative defense, in a non-homicide case, the defendant has to come forward then with proof of self-defense. Mm -hmm. Ironically, in a homicide case, it's the reverse, and the state has to actually come and prove that it was not self-defense. Now, you were actually also involved in the passage of this legislation back in 2006. What was the intent? Because it seems as though this duty to retreat had been somewhat a part of common law. And um, so what was the intent behind removing that duty to retreat from the law in 2006? Well, a couple of things. First of all, in Louisiana, if you were in your home, there was still a presumption that you didn't have to flee before this statute was ever enacted. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just a part of our self-defense within your home. The castle doctrine, we've heard that, that reference made in the news, the castle, the a woman's home is her castle, uh, so to speak. Um, and so that was there for when you were in your home already in, Louis in Louisiana law. Mm -hmm. um, it was not there for other situations. Okay. Um, so again, I think the intent, as I remember it, because I was involved just a little bit, it didn't take much. It passed unanimously through House committees and on the floor, so it was not a big issue. Um, but part of the intent came from experiences during Katrina, mm -hmm. you know, where a lot of people felt threatened and concerned, particularly in their homes and that. The National Rifle Association was involved in originally drafting the bill. Um, you know, so I know that it was a bill that was found in other states, which is often the case, and came into Louisiana that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know there was some discussion from just on the street, so to speak, of people being more concerned about their safety and being able to defend themselves and their property after Katrina. Okay. Now, Representative Burrell, what is wrong with retreating? What's wrong with that duty to retreat if you can do so safely? Why do you think that is being removed from the law? Well, I don't, personally, I don't find that it, it's a problem in retreating. And, and, and if you retreat and it'll save your life, then fine. Uh, but what I was concerned about uh, was the fact that if a person pursued the individual, even if they are the aggressor, and you, and you use force or violence or, or deadly force, mm -hmm. then it, it should not uh, exempt you from being viewed as an uh, individual that has some responsibility in this. Okay, and you, you, you bring us to my next point, which is your proposed legislation to help improve Louisiana's Stand Your Ground statute or our justifiable homicide statute. Could you um, tell us, if you will, what deficiencies did you find in our current law that you are hoping to address? And we're gonna talk about that right after we get back. We have to take a short break, but we'll pick up right there when we get back. If you're a lawyer and you would like to be a guest on the Legal Roundtable TV show, call Shaniqua Gray at 225-772-1819 or email to the Legal Roundtable at Herzog.com. These are your human rights. There are 30 of them. They belong to you. You don't have to buy them, or apply for them, or ask permission to have them. They're just yours. No matter who you are, where you're from, how old you are, or anything else. It's just that simple. Now some people may try to ignore your rights, or violate them, or pretend they don't exist. 
but they can't change the fact that they are yours. Human right number 30. No one can take away your human rights. What are human rights? Find out at youthforhumanrights.org. Welcome back to the Legal Roundtable. I'm Shaniqua Gray, and we're talking about self-defense in Louisiana in light of the Trayvon Martin shooting tragedy in Sanford, Florida. And I'm speaking with Representative Burrell and Professor Getty. When we left, um, Representative Burrell, you were about to talk to us about your proposed legislation for changes to Louisiana's justifiable homicide statute. Could you tell us what deficiencies or problems you may have found in the statute that you're hoping to address by this legislation? Well, it was my hope to just sort of tweak the law uh, as it is right now because I had a problem with, uh, I, I really don't have a problem with the justified um, justifiable homicide statute. Mm -hmm. Uh, or the uh, stand your ground, except where we're talking about an aggressor. Mm -hmm. As you know, justifiable homicide it, it basically says that if, if, if you feel that your life or someone else's life is in, in, in jeopardy, you could use force, violence, or deadly force. And the stand your ground basically says that if you are in a place where you should be, however that is defined, then you have the right to stand your ground and use force, violence, or deadly force. Mm -hmm. But when you get into the issue of a person leaving that a location and pursuing mm -hmm. uh, someone and then use force, violence, or deadly force, then it becomes a little gray mm -hmm. here. And I think in Trayvon Martin's case, that was the case. So. Given that fact, there was a lot of things that took place that still yet to be proven, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if they're an aggressor, then I think that issue should be addressed, and, and hopefully my bill will address it. In other words, it doesn't immune them mm -hmm. from uh, being able to be charged uh, if they are the aggressor. Now, you've been talking about the aggressor. And for those who do not understand what the aggressor is and Louisiana's aggressor doctrine, what is that? Well, it's the one who, who actually pursues someone else if the threat is removed. Mm -hmm. See, if the threat is removed by the perpetrator, the, the person who is, um, um, I guess, threatening, then the person who is threatened, if they pursue that individual, then that means that, that the, the uh, person who was the uh, aggressor, which is the person who's perpetrating the, the, the crime, then that threat is removed because they are, they are moving away from them or running away from them. Mm -hmm. And if, if they pursue them and then use force or violence or deadly force, then they should not be immune mm -hmm. from, from the law. Okay. We're not saying that the existing law will, will be eliminated. Uh, the present law will still be in place, mm -hmm. but it does allow the uh, law enforcement to investigate it, uh, those, uh, that situation. Okay, so, hope, so hopefully we would have a goal of making sure that the case is fully investigated instead of allowing it to basically be stifled as some are calling this Trayvon Martin shooting. Right. Assume that, that, that the, the person is in their right to pursue them mm -hmm. and then not investigate it. Okay. Now, uh, why do you think, Representative Burrell, this whole stand-the-ground law and everything that has happened in Florida, why is it so controversial? Do you believe that perhaps this is a misunderstood law, that people are thinking that it's giving them certain rights that it does not actually authorize? Well, I think it does. I, and, and I think, uh, you know, the media has sort of changed this a bit because mm -hmm. Uh, given the fact that any time race enter into something, mm -hmm. it's exacerbated. Mm -hmm. And people who would probably look at the law, uh, stand your, your ground law as something that would protect both sides, mm -hmm. now it, it looked as though it is a race thing, one against the other, and it makes it very difficult to, um, to really get to the bottom 
the true bottom of it. Now, race has certainly been an issue that has come out as this case has been covered in the media, Professor Getty. What other issues do you think are raised based on how this case has been covered in the media, basically tried in the media? This case has been an excellent example of why we shouldn't try it in the media mm -hmm. and why we have a situation like this go all the way to trial for many reasons. I think we've seen over the past few weeks how little bits of evidence leak out, whereas at a trial all the evidence is corralled and brought together and presented at one time. Mm -hmm. There are numerous types of evidence uh, that have come out through media sources in that that may or may not even be admissible at trial. Uh, there's been an outcry, for example, you know, that there hasn't been an arrest or that the prosecutor hasn't uh, charged Mr. Zimmerman with any crime. And, and of course, today we're hearing that uh, she's choosing not to go to the grand jury with this, um, which tells us a couple of things, that apparently he won't be charged with a first or possibly second degree murder. I'm not sure what the Florida statutes are, but here it would be first or second degree murder, which requires an indictment. And that would be, if she charges him, it would be with a lesser form. But the prosecutor corrals all the evidence, looks it over, and also makes a determination of what's going to be admissible in court. Think about uh, some voice identification experts have been on the media, as an example, talking about whose voice it was screaming out that is not admissible at trial because the courts have looked at that kind of expert uh, testimony, that kind of scientific evidence, and found it's not reliable. Mm -hmm. And as an example, the, at least one person that I've seen is talking, you know, it, even what he has done to compare it isn't how it's done even in a scientific method. So those things are considered, um, and the fact that a jury's going to be hearing it and weighing it and that is also taken into account. Okay, well we certainly have to stay tuned to see what else is going to happen with this case, and we just really wanted to make sure we give our viewers some insight as to what's going on in Louisiana with self-defense and thank you both for coming and speaking with us about self-defense in Louisiana. I appreciate you coming. Well, thank you for the invite. If you're a lawyer and you would like to be a guest on the Legal Roundtable TV show, Call Shaniqua Gray at 225-772-1819 or email to the Legal Roundtable at Herzog.com. We're all born free and equal. These are your human rights. There are 30 of them. They belong to you. You don't have to buy them or apply for them or ask permission to have them. They're just yours. No matter who you are, where you're from, how old you are, or anything else. It's just that simple. Now some people may try to ignore your rights, or violate them, or pretend they don't exist. But they can't change the fact that they're yours. our next segment, we're talking about compensation statutes, Louisiana's efforts to compensate the wrongly convicted who have been exonerated from those crimes. Discussing this issue with us tonight, our guests are attorney Christian Winstrom, a staff attorney with the Innocence Project New Orleans, who was, whose work includes representing wrongfully convicted youth sentenced to life without parole in Louisiana, and she also represents Innocence Project New Orleans exonerees on their applications for compensation for wrongful conviction. We also have with us Gregory Bright. He was wrongfully convicted in 1975 and sentenced to life in prison for a crime he did not commit. He served 27 and a half years before being exonerated in 2003. He currently works part-time at Innocence Project New Orleans as the Assistant Education and Outreach Director, speaking around the country about his wrongful incarceration and life since his release. Thank you both for joining us Thank this you. evening. Ms. Winstrom, let me begin with you. Could you describe exactly what does the Innocence Project do? Sure. We are a nonprofit law office. We represent people who are wrongfully convicted and are serving life without parole sentences in Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, we investigate the cases, we prove their innocence, and we exonerate them using the post-conviction process. 
we've freed 21 uh, individuals from Louisiana and Mississippi. Okay, now after these individuals are exonerated, you say 21 in Louisiana and Mississippi, obviously that there are a lot of needs, housing, medical expenses, and I would assume that is where this compensation statute came into play. Could you explain what this compensation statute does for these exonerated individuals? Sure. When uh, an exoneree is compensated, they receive uh, $25,000 per year that they were wrongfully incarcerated. However, there's a cap at $250,000. So um, then they also receive up to $80,000 in what we call loss of life opportunities money. Um, this is money that should help them uh, cover medical bills, um, uh, education, job skills training, that kind of thing. And when did this statute go into play? It was initially enacted in 2005 and it's been um, edited and amended since then. Last year, during the legislative session, it was increased from $15,000 per year to $25,000 per year. So there was an increase last year in the amount of compensation. Okay, and also from $150,000 as maximum to $250,000, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, you, um, and this would also be retroactive to people who had been exonerated prior to 2005? Yes. When it was initially enacted in 2005, there was a time set up in which anybody who was exonerated before that time could, could file, and then, of course, anyone who was exonerated thereafter could and likewise the statute last last uh, the bill from last session um, was also uh, retroactive so anybody who had been previously compensated could go back and get the additional hundred thousand dollars okay that's wonderful now mr. bright you spent 27 and a half years incarcerated for a crime you did not commit as of today have you received any compensation from the state of Louisiana for that injustice that you serve yes I've, I've been compensated I uh, I received a hundred and ninety thousand in uh, June of last year okay. uh, prior to that uh, um, I hadn't received anything now you had been exonerated since 2003 so there had to have been a number of needs that you had in that amount of time for transportation medical expenses could you explain what you were experiencing all of those years trying to sort of transition back into mainstream society without any help oh well it's been rough uh, it's been extremely rough uh, I uh, initially started out uh, working at restaurants and you know working in um, little odd jobs and stuff like that and it's very very difficult you know to come out of a situation like that and not even have you know health care or anything you know mm -hmm. so um you know the transition had been uh extremely difficult mm -hmm. now i understand that now you are working with the innocence project and you have also been an advocate could you explain the type of work you have done even in light of all that, that you have suffered, what are you doing now in order to, I guess, sort of give back or, or help the next set of generation that's coming behind you? Well, I've been to uh, a, a number of places. I've been um, around the country. I've uh, been to churches, been to schools. Uh, I've talked to, um, you know, a crowd of uh, 150. I've talked to as few as two people. and. You know, I'm always uh, very, very inspired by the response that I get from people mm -hmm. who, after they hear this story, is just uh, just overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they talk about uh, reform. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a good thing to, to hear people who basically have no experience with this issue, mm -hmm. you know, once they hear it, to, to, to want to give and want to do something about it is... It's the joy and the pleasure that I get out of it. I'm pleased to have you here to have hear you talk about your experience and how you have turned such a negative experience into something positive. Um, how did receiving compensation under this statute really help you to accomplish those goals? Well, it helped me uh, a great deal. For one thing, um, it's kind of it's kind of bittersweet because uh, for me, you know, coming from a family of uh, you know people who are in need you know what I mean these are hard times and you know it's, it's kind of difficult to you know 
to have money and and not share it you know mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's one of the things that um you know i was concerned about that you know perhaps i have to get some things done before you know the money all runs out but um mm -hmm. um i was able to do that you know i was able to secure a place to a home a nice home and stuff and i think that um is the first uh, step toward you know getting my life back in order that's wonderful now, would you make, and I know that Ms. Winstrom indicated that this statute was just amended to provide for more compensation. Is there anything else you would recommend in order to better address the needs of an exoneree who, who's just coming out of prison after all that time that would, that would help them? Well, I think the, 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 the number one thing is that, you know, guys need financial help. And I think that once our code has determined that this person has been wrongly convicted, I think there shouldn't be any delays in the amount of time that uh, they receive the compensation. I know for me, if I had uh, received compensation, you know, the minute I would have got out, then my transition would have been much smoother mm -hmm. by now. Um, but I find myself going through changes, you know, right now that um, perhaps it would have been uh, solved had I received the funds years ago. So I think that, that that's, that's key. Getting the, the funds to these guys as soon as possible, is, uh, I think, is number one. And I think that raises a good, a good issue, Ms. Winstrom. How many states have these compensation statutes in place? And is it a relatively simple process, or is this a complicated process for them to get the, the compensation? Uh, there are 27 states in the, the nation that have compensation statutes, plus uh, District of Columbia and the, and the federal government. Um, and in terms of ease, it's, it's designed to be easier than a typical lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, procedures in place in the statute to make sure that the process moves along under a certain timeline. Mm -hmm. There have been cases, though, and, and Greg's is an example of uh, where these cases have gotten held up for years. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, it's easier. We don't ha you have to prove that the person is innocent of the crime that they were charged with, but you don't have to prove liability. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's supposed to make it the process easier. Okay, and so um, does the Innocence Project have threshold amounts or, or suggestions that you all are making for states either amending their statutes or who are enacting these compensation statutes? Um, in Louisiana currently is the second worst state in, uh, in the nation that has a compensation statute. And what we're hoping to do is improve the statute just to get it more in line with other, other states. Um, and we look to our neighbors, for example. So, um, Mississippi has um, a compensation of 50000 per year with a cap of 500000 Texas has a compensation of 80000 per year with no cap. Thank you so much for coming, Ms. Winstrom and Mr. Brad. I truly appreciate you all being a guest here on The Legal Roundtable. And that's all we have time for today. Join us next time on The Legal Roundtable with Shaniqua Gray.